Welcome back, everybody, to the Fenton Perspective. I am standing in for Lori and Fenton. I'm Solaris Blurivan, and I'm here with my very special guest, Charles Ostman. Are you with me, Charles? I hope so. All right. <laughs> well, this, could, this could be my <laughs> synthetic sentient standing. Uh, you know? It works oh, for I... me because that's what I am. My avatar is here, too. That's right. We're just a bunch of cells, but, you know, we sort of hanging out together for the that's most right. part. That's right. works for me. Well, there you know. I didn't mean to cut you off when we hit the break, but if you want to continue on. Yeah, no, I do want to get into like a, a sort of somewhat monotonous uh, dissertation on the economic theory. But the, but the basic idea is AI is already running our majority of the world's economic engines. That's the point I was trying to get at. Mm -hmm. um, you know, and this may be kind of a difficult concept to grasp onto at first. But again, the whole idea was to suggest that AI has gone beyond just something that walks and talks or looks like a human or that you're going to somehow integrate with in your daily life, it's already here. You just don't see it. And so the, in many cases, and when I've given these lectures in the past, and I often people often talk about the singularity, and, oh, my gosh, you know, we're going to have this sort of day or night transition, and all of a sudden we're going to wake up one day. No, it's not, I don't see it that way at all. Can you I define see, the singularity, Charles? I know a lot of people are talking about it. Can you can you give us more information sure, on that? Sure, sure. And this, this is really comes out of, uh, Ray Kurzweil's sort of view on this, and there's a lot of other folks that kind of agree in this particular camp. And there's actually a Singularity University. I've actually spoken there. And uh, going back a few years, there was this annual event called the Singularity Summit, which was a pretty interesting event. And the first one was at Stanford. It was a very nice compendium of all the different thinkers and actual researchers at the time. But the basic idea is this, that there's going to be a merging between human and artificial intelligence where the two become essentially the same that is the machine intelligence will become equal to or greater than the capacity for human intelligence and there will be a kind of a a moment as it were where this symbiosis becomes ubiquitous and as common as life you know as common as daily life is now only really part of this sort of artificial intelligence realm that will become synergistically and, and hopefully in a positive way sort of married to or become part of ourselves. This may or may not be exactly how it works, and I would grant that that process probably will occur, but I think there's a lot of other things that are going on behind the scenes where we've gotten much further into this symbiosis than just having a machine that looks like a human and walks and talks and sounds like you or I having a conversation. I think that's just one very narrow, actually, uh, way of looking at that idea. I mean, when the film AI came out, you know, probably a few years ago, it was kind of the Kurzweil's vision of the AI singularity being met at that point in time. That is when a human-like entity could match what looks like a real human in terms of thought, uh, emotions perhaps, and, and just as we would cognize or understand another human being to be. That's just one piece of a larger puzzle. Um, in my opinion we may not even recognize synthetic sentience when it occurs. And I think that's kind of the larger takeaway that I would suggest. So in other words, instead of a singularity, I see it more as a transition, as a process. Mm -hmm. And the rate of that process and the extent to which it extends into all areas of existence, be it the physical realm or even the sort of uh, subconscious realm, and I think that's probably where you and I might have more discussion because... We talk a lot about, you know, mind control and subtle influences, in our thought patterns and the whole idea that I often have talked about something I refer to as neurological sovereignty, that sort of thing, where your thoughts may or may not be your own, that sort of thing. I think that's a much more realistic way of looking at where this singularity threshold might be. So the Kurzweil vision is at some point machine intelligence matches human intelligence and they become sort of interchangeable. I would offer a slightly different view that says that machine intelligence will not only exceed human intelligence, but maybe a very different kind of intelligence. And we may not even recognize it as it occurs. Right. It might morph on its own. It might morph on its own. Mm -hmm. and, and because it's an evolutionary type of process, it will determine what it feels is its own best response to the stimuli it encounters. It's able to think. And yeah, well, that's, I think we're already there, to be honest with you, especially where I've been with the covert technology and the synthetic telepathy. I can tell you, I, I believe that we are, it's probably not being deployed um, 100%, but it's there. It's right there. Well, you know, what's kind of interesting, and maybe this may be a sort of an odd way of looking at it, but I, Hollywood, strangely enough, and I, I going back in just a few years, I used to spend a lot of time in Los Angeles because part of my work was involved there. And in fact, actually, I was involved with some of the projects that were part of the ISI, the Information Science Institute, 
and I even spent some time consulting around, which is another long story. I won't go into it all, but, but, you know, I spent some time in that area. So I, I, I knew a few people in the academic world, one of whom was a professor, um, uh, who actually was sort of like the father of computational anthropology. Um, he's, he's now at Duke university and, and his work is quite well known, but back in the day, I used to go to these parties at his house, uh, Nick Gessler, that's his name, professor Gessler. And, you know, there'd be a bunch of people there, you know, all very nice and well-dressed, and it was kind of fun. People would be having a few drinks and whatever. It turns out that quite a few of these folks were writers and directors and people of the sort of movie universe, and they would, you know, very openly admit they were just there to kind of listen, and they would throw in their comments. But the whole idea is they were kind of, you know, <laughs> extracting from us <laughs> our thoughts as to what they think, you know, might be an interesting plot line or an interesting story or something that they could turn into what would eventually become a, a movie theme. So having been there and having actually been part of this process, I, I'm not saying you should go to the movies as a way to look at what the future is, but there is a kind of a, 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 a kind of a sense of they're trying to use drama and, you know, special effects and all the rest of it, but just kind of, prime the general audience to be ready for these futuristic realms, some of which are kind of extreme and probably unlikely, but a lot of which are not unlikely at all. Mm -hmm. So going back a few years, I remember quite distinctly when I was talking to this one gentleman, who I won't name on the air, but kind of well-known in the Hollywood world, and I was talking about um, neural implants and nanoscale devices that could directly connect to neurons in the brain and become kind of a neural interface and the fact that your thoughts would become something that could be seen on a screen and used to play back to other people's thought patterns and all this kind of thing. And of course, there've been a few movies that have come out along these lines. But what was interesting was I went into his office one day just because I was there to meet some other people. And on the wall were these really beautifully rendered, these three-dimensional renderings of these biochip implants, these neural implant chips. And they were almost exactly, <laughs> I mean, I actually drew some pictures and said, this is this is my best guess as to how this technology will probably play out in the next few years. So there on the wall in this guy's office were all these beautifully rendered 3D prints of these of these biochip and neural implants. And, uh, and I asked him, I said, you know, that looks kind of like the stuff we're talking about. I said, yeah, that's part of your stuff over there, Charles. <laughs> I was going to you know? say, wow, where's your percentage, right? <laughs> <laughs> so, I mean, I'm, I'm not just one of, I mean, and believe me, there's quite a few other people. I'm, I'm just one of a tiny, like a tiny dot in a much larger radar screen. But the point is, these folks do spend their time to harvest whatever they can harvest from the thinkers and actual researchers of, of the moment mm -hmm. to get what they think is a reasonable depiction of what history, future history might look like. So I, I'm not, you know, I, I watch a lot of films, not so much because I, I'm sort of taken over by the beautiful actress or whatever, but, but I am kind of interested to see how they interpret this sort of information stream. And then they translate into some kind of a script and a story so, I mean, I've seen film, like the version was kind of interesting. I, I think that was one possible way of looking at something and not to go too much into the, the theme of the film. He had these different types of people and they were sort of segregated by their potential, potential talents or, or personality types. And he had the thinkers and he had the doers and the military types and whatever. But the fun part was that a lot of the film's plot line had to do with this sort of injectable, uh, for better choice of words, sort of like neural nanites that would change a person's way of being. It would allow their conscience to become part of a meta scale, sort of like a hive, like a Borg like system as it were. And there's a, there's a part of the plot where this uh, evil political person tries to glomp onto the military because they have these neural implants and then tries to do a, like a coup or a takeover. Okay. That was a, you know, Hollywood and it was kind of fun to watch, but, but here's the caveat, the stuff that they were kind of looking at as a potential Avenue where this might go, well, it's not that far off. In other words, if you look at the current genre of things that are in development, in terms, I mean, the most recent thing that I think is kind of fascinating actually is this area called optogenetics, uh, where light can be used to switch on or off different neural or synaptical functions. And this actually is done by transfecting a uh, photoreactive protein from a, a microorganism, and then you sort of implant it into the neural tissue. And it's a long explanation, but the short version is. It's a way to create a kind of a, a, a series of optically addressable voxels, volumetric pixels inside the brain that you can then uh, sort of put signals into and, and actually change what the brain's processing consists of. Mm -hmm. So that's one piece of a puzzle. Then at the uh, another piece of the puzzle is Paul Gant right here at UC Berkeley, who's quite famous now. And he's a bunch of other folks that have now sort of mirrored his research. Um, they actually have the ability to 
in a sense, play back what your mind is, what your brain has already seen. In other words, if you've witnessed uh, an event or just went out somewhere and walked around and saw beautiful scenes of trees or, or you witnessed something terrible like a, like a car crash or maybe a crime being committed, whatever it is, that all these things that you experience leave a quasi-permanent imprint in your synaptical system. I mean, there's different portions of the brain that specialize in different kinds of information storage, but the point is, can one, um, by using something called fMRI, can one instigate or trigger the brain to play back or release this stored content? And what's fascinating is, and you can go online and see this for yourself, people have now created movies or, or film clips, if you will, video clips of information played back from the brain. And they've it's been done thousands of times over again. In other words, people come in, they're shown a series of photographs or shown a series of video clips, and then they use the FMRI, fMRI process to extract what they've seen, and then they compare it to the thing that they saw. It's pretty close. I mean, it, the, the resolution's still kind of coarse, but clearly, I mean, if you ever saw the film Brainstorm, which came out in the mid-'80s, awesome. uh, it's, it's kind of the real-world version of Brainstorm. And I tell people this, and they think, oh, come on, Charles, you're just you know, staying up too late. No, 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 just go <laughs> to Dr. Kennett's lab. You can see it for yourself. And sure enough, when people go on the website and they actually look at the films that have been produced, they go, wow, <laughs> that's a little bit interesting. Okay, fine. So in other words, this is all kind of outside the eye of the general public. It's not something that makes mainstream news. I mean, most people are fixated on the politics of the moment or you know, whatever is the, the current headlines. Mm -hmm. But meanwhile, in the, in the background, there's all this stuff moving along at a very fast pace. So you have either whether it's the ability to extract things from the brain directly and translate it into uh, viable forms of information and or mechanisms that you can use to get into the brain right. using optogenetics or other kinds of molecular scale or nanoscale things that can directly interact with your synaptical systems, the ganglia, the collections of, of <coughs> sorry, synapses as are put together in these ganglia, you can't even talk about it, ganglionic structures. Your, your oh, brain uh, is going super fast forward. You're good. <laughs> yeah, I can't speak I'm catching faster, it. Right. Really, I am. Yeah, yeah. I, my, my, unfortunately, <laughs> we can't do telepathy. It's still radio, right? I so, can. Um, oh, no, go oh, ahead. There, well, yes, you can. You're special, mm -hmm. but you're special. So aside from special people like yourself, um, for, you know, if, if I try to explain just how quickly this stuff's moved along. It sounds like science fiction. It sounds like something of a movie. What I'm trying to get across is when you see stuff in the in the Hollywood productions, yeah, they're they're ridiculously over dramatic and you know way over the top special effects and everything. But the core concepts are actually surprisingly close to what's really going on. That was the that was the basic idea when they get across. You know, what also comes to mind when you were talking about um, a potential data mining or extracting information from what we what I would say like a recorder cell of something of an event. What that would be phenomenal if we could do that with murder victims, and we could. I mean, I don't. I want to look at it on a positive scale for forensics. Yeah, sure. No, I you imagine accessing uh, a murder victim and being able to extract that information, capturing it, and being able to to get the uh, the perpetrator. Huh? This was actually attempted in court about four, almost five years ago now. I, I remember it's either Michigan or Minnesota. I forgot. I think it was Michigan. And at the at a certain threshold, the court rejected it because the the claim from the other side, the defense, as it were, said that well, it, the the technology isn't quite refined enough yet. It's still kind of iffy. And okay, fine. But in India, in India, there have been court cases which have been successfully prosecuted based specifically on, you know, did the murderer see the body on the floor at this point in time? And by using the fMRI process, they could extract enough of an image to say, yeah, this person was there and they saw the body on the floor, you know, whatever they're trying to prove. That's already been done. That's amazing. Uh, again, it is amazing. Now, again, this is in India, and maybe the legal system's a bit different than it is here, and, and for various political reasons, they may be more ambitious to want to try to use the sort of leading-edge technology. But clearly the precedent for this kind of a concept has already been established. So give it another five or eight or 10 years. And I think this will be much more commonplace. Mm -hmm. I agree. With you. It's like having an internal surveillance camera. Well, funny you should bring that up because mm -hmm. I mean the, 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 okay. So right now, again, a little bit political here, but I mean, for obvious reasons, everybody's been very bent on the idea of body, body cameras for police and for, you know, various enforcement agencies, this kind of thing, which I actually, I agree with. Um, and there's been a lot of controversy about, well, now we're discovering all these things that these folks have been doing, which nobody would approve of, but now we can see it on camera. Well, okay, fine. So does the public pressure for that kind of democrat democratization of enforcement activities, which is now pushing for body cams and virtually all forms of law enforcement, 
would this be the beginning edge of a future realm, kind of like Minority Report in a way, if you recall that film. Yeah. Um, where it wouldn't just be a, the camera that you're wearing, they could inter- turn off because of, there's been a lot of controversy about some of these, some of the more dubious police violence cases, that sort of thing, where the, suddenly the camera gets turned off by accident, quote unquote, or it, the battery failed, or, you know, whatever. Uh, well, if you had direct neural uh, interface of some sort, you wouldn't really have that excuse. In other words, I could see a way that the public would actually accept and even push for this kind of approach right. because it would be seen as a solution for these otherwise really d- dubious and sort of dark enforcement activities. Okay, I get that. However, once you open that Pandora's box, where else would this go? Dot, dot, dot. Yeah. <laughs> and, and so in many ways, and now we can go into a bunch of different directions. One of the areas that I probably would want to go in is in the whole idea of the commoditization of DNA or commoditization of your genetic footprint as a, as a sort of commercial product, which is actually what's happening as we speak. Um, the, another one that is kind of interesting zones, because as you probably know, um, uh, Solera, the company that... Um, um, commercialized or co- commoditized the, the human genome, and Craig right. Venter, his founder, uh, <laughs> just went public. Yes, indeed. Just went public. Right. It, it, it sounds like your name has been used it for does. a company. I it's know. Like, I think I'm in there somewhere. I, it's it's yeah. spelled differently, but probably there's a subliminal input to uh-huh. there. I'm sure you're in there somewhere. I sure am. But anyway, but see, you're just ahead of your time. What can I say? But anyway, so for the rest of the world, though, um, so the point is, Craig Venter came out about three weeks ago now and sort of publicly announced this sort of big new plan and the big new plan is to commoditize the general public's DNA as, as a sort of a new footprint, a way to track your identity, the way to measure for potential diseases and, you know, potentially uh, genetically oriented health problems, that kind of thing. But as you can obviously, I'm sure, already could have get a gander on, for anyone who's ever seen the film Gattaca, well, you know, <laughs> oh, yeah. this is kind of where it's going. Okay, so so how would this get played into the general public? Well, I think the obvious uh, sort of pathways I see it today, and other folks, folks tend to agree, is that as an access to health care and as an access to creditworthiness and as an access to your status in the sort of social strata, as it were, and this kind of tests back to this film Diversion, where you had these four specific social classes, and they were, they were determined by sort of a combination of behavior and genetic content and some other variables. But, you know, again, it was sort of like a modernized version of Gattaca in a way. But here you have the real thing. And the people used to argue against this being feasible in the past would say, well, it's way too much data and it'd be way too expensive. And how can you possibly, you know, map out everyone's genome? And, you know, thought, okay, fine. Well, several years ago, myself and quite a few others said, well, okay, it's just a cost curve. I mean, at one point it cost ten thousand dollars to map out a human genome then it shrank down to a thousand dollars and now we're approaching a hundred dollars well pretty soon it's going to be around ten dollars in other words you can kind of see where this is going it's kind of like an inverse moore's law for genetic coding is you know in other words just like moore's law describes the computing capacity or number of transistors you can put on a chip there's different ways to measure this metric same thing can be applied to biological processes so as a sort of an inverse moore's law the cost of genome decoding drops precipitously and at the same time the ability to process zettabytes of data and zettabytes is a real number by the way 10 to 21 um you know if you go if you look at the nsa uh, sort of facility in utah it's a zettabyte facility that's Mm -hmm. what that means so they can they you know billions of trillions literally billions of trillions of bytes of information considered as a normal computing uh, scale of, of data processing Okay, fine. Done. It's it's a it's a it's a cost of uh, you know it's simply a cost of putting the installation into practice. So once you have this scale of data processing available, which you have now, and now here's the fun part: if you combine that with artificial intelligence, which can look for very subtle variations in pattern sets, you see where this is going. Mm-hmm. In other words, if you're scanning you know extremely complex genetic maps, which they are very complex. And you have you know millions of them to process simultaneously to look for different commonalities and different fluctuations and certain kinds of data points you're looking for. This would have been unthinkable maybe 10 years ago, but in today's world, oh no, it's quite thinkable. However, the thinking is not with humans. The thinking is with AIs. And furthermore, if the evolutionary AIs are trained to look for things that they think are interesting, they will on their own magnify what they want to pursue. Mm-hmm. 
so the choices that are made in terms of who is genetically acceptable material or who is genetically defined as the appropriate variation to go into a different form of education, perhaps, or a different status of creditworthiness, perhaps, or a different status of, say, military service, you know, whatever it might be, or, or say, athletic or sports kind of categories, that kind of thing, whatever it might be, people are going to pay big money for this. Trust me, they will, and they already are. So can people like Craig Venter capitalize? Can he become like the Google of genetics? In fact, he used those very words, by the way, when he made his public statement about three weeks ago. He literally called himself the, you know, the Google of DNA. That's his, that's his stated business platform. That's, that's how he sort of framed this. Mm-hmm. So clearly you can see where this is going. If you have <clears throat> excuse me, things like Google, which track behavior, cognition, various forms of influence, you know, both subtle and, and conscious as, as a word, sort of mixed together, and you're sort of extracting a kind of a consciousness map, as it were, to see what kind of things people respond to and how well they're influenced by different kinds of advertising, exposure, you know, et cetera, et cetera. And then you map that against genetic content. Well, gee, I mean, <laughs> it's not hard to put those dots together. So is there a commercial incentive to go in this direction? Of course there is. We're talking, I mean, if you think did the IPO for Facebook or Google or something like that is a big deal. Wait till this comes out the door and becomes an IPO potential. It, it, I mean, it makes Microsoft look like a dot in the background compared to where this is going. <laughs> so for a lot of people that talk about what's the next big thing, uh, what's the next big bulge in the economy, what's the next big something to get involved with, it's going to be in this sort of bio realm. That's that's really where I see things. In fact, I have a couple of friends who are, per- and I won't name them in there, but they're very big in the sort of bioinformatics business. And trust me, this one, if if there was ever, you know, if you're a young kid in college right now and you want to say, OK, where's my fast ticket to, you know, big salary? <laughs> that's where you want to be. You want to be somewhere in this sort of genetic slash bioinformatics kind of universe. That's that's where the that's where the growth curve is. Right. I'm not saying this in a raw, raw kind of way. I'm just saying as a factual description, this is where things are going. But in parallel with this, in parallel with the physical molecular sort of nanobiological aspects of this you have the virtual ai intelligence aspect of this which is actually of a higher value and let me explain what i mean by this when you look at the in fact fact, by the way you probably saw this today the largest pharmaceutical um uh, merger in history just occurred pfizer combined Mm -hmm. with this uh irish company and the whole reason it is by the way so they could shift all their tax burden to Ireland, which is essentially not, you know, virtually no taxes at all. It's a whole other discussion, actually. But, you know, people that talk about the pharma industrial complex, and I mean pharma spelled with a PH, um, this is exactly a, a good snapshot of where this is going, because this is an enormous, um, when people talk about anti-monopoly uh, sort of political moves and this kind of thing, you know, every time people get so riled up about, well, this is next big merger and fine, just forget all this stuff because it doesn't matter where it, it, nation states don't define these things anymore. The corporate structures, they don't care what country they're in. They just care about how, what's the best way to articulate their business strategy. So this is a good example of it. But where I was trying to go with this is in the pharmaceutical sort of biotech universe, the biggest value is not in the chemistry. It's, it's not in the physical drugs or the things that you produce that come out in a pill or come out in a serum of some kind. No, the biggest value is in the AI. It's in the computing algorithms, which are incredibly tightly guarded. In other words, if you look at the patents that are filed, and believe me, I spent a lot of time on patents, um, it's amazing when you sort of wander your way through genetic and or bio-related patents. 